Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by two very special guests, Danny Grant of USV and Landon Brand of REN. Uh, Landon, Danny, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Eric. Hey, thanks so much for having us. Awesome. So we're here today to talk about REN, and we're here today to talk about uh, analyzing investments in in climate change space and in the environment from an investor perspective. So Landon, let, let's start with you. Why don't you give an introduction as to what REN is and how you navigated the idea maze of why to start it? Why that idea out of all the ideas you could have pursued to, to uh, help contribute to solving climate change? Yeah, so the simplest way to explain REN is it's a monthly subscription to offset your carbon footprint. So people go to our website, they calculate their carbon footprint by entering information like how much they fly, how much they drive, Um, even your diet, which affects your carbon footprint. And then we give them a number. This is your carbon footprint. And you could offset that by funding like rainforest protection or tree planting um, that pulls down the equivalent of your carbon footprint. So it's kind of like compensating for your emissions. Originally, we thought of this idea because we saw a lot of friends of ours were worried about climate change and the thing that they were doing was like stopping using plastic straws or trying to turn the thermostat down a tiny bit. Um, Really small changes that as a whole have a ton of impacts, but they don't give you the feeling like, oh, we're going to solve climate change by not using plastic straws. Like there's just way more climate anxiety than those sorts of solutions can fix. So with REN, what we really care about is giving people some easy first steps to addressing climate change in their own life, whether that's reducing their carbon footprint or just doing a simple monthly subscription to do something about climate change. And what's so great about REN is it's about carbon. Like it's just about taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's what is causing the climate crisis. It's just uh, 37 billion tons of carbon every year just released into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, trapping heat on the Earth. And so the most important thing is just taking that carbon out of the Earth's atmosphere and putting it back into biomass, back into the ground. And uh, REN launched maybe six months ago. And so far, uh, REN subscribers have taken 20,000 tons of carbon out of the air and put it back into trees, which is awesome. And it's just like steady drumbeat. Uh, They have this counter on the front page of their site. And every time you check, it's just higher and higher. Like this is a community that's trying together to reverse the climate crisis. Uh, Danny, let's get uh, more into that. So you you uh, became smart over the past six months in the space, going, going deep on it. What is uh, what is causing causing the climate crisis, or what are the big misconceptions people have uh, about it? Well, the good news is the age of misconceptions in the U.S. are very near to be over. Seventy percent of Americans uh, believe in climate change and are aware of the climate crisis. For us, uh, Albert really kind of came to his senses first. Uh, At USB, we do kind of a weekly meeting that's more day-to-day operations. Um, And then we do uh, every few weeks a three-hour discussion about more macro trends. And and usually someone will be very passionate about something and they'll they'll send around um, some pre-reading. And Albert sends around this paper called Deep Adaptation. It's out of the Institute of Leadership and Sustainability in the UK. And and what this paper does is just lay out the facts um, of the climate crisis and and argues, actually today, all of climate research is about uh, figuring out how to reverse this trajectory, but we are in such a trajectory where we also need climate research to be done about how we can drastically adapt in the near term and long term to the new situation in which we are finding ourselves. And this was such a huge wake up call. Albert uh, put this in really great framing. He says, he asks this great question of like, hey, every day, how many Hiroshima-sized bombs of energy worth of carbon do you think are released into the Earth's atmosphere? So so people usually say like, you know, 10, (laughs) 100. (laughs) But really, a Hiroshima-sized bomb worth of energy of carbon is being released into the Earth's atmosphere every second. So it's 86,000 a day. 
And 93% of that is just absorbed by the ocean. Um, and what that does is uh, me like melt glaciers. So uh, this year, Antarctica will lose 150 billion tons of ice. Greenland will lose uh, close to 300, oh, sorry, uh, million tons of ice. Greenland will lose uh, close to 400 or 300 million tons of ice. And, uh, uh, and, and this is just like an increasing rate. Carbon interacts with the water in the ocean, uh, creating this kind of like carbonic acid. And so the, the acidity level of the ocean has like increased by 30% uh, in the last, I don't know, 100 years. And uh, half of the coral reefs in the earth are now dead or dying. Um, and so it's, we're in this kind of very drastic state of the world. And uh, it just feels very, very clear that the best thing to, we can do um, as a society is help people um, come together to use things like REN to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the earth. Yeah. H how do we think about the different levers that, that, that are possible here and what, what makes the, the biggest impact? There's a few, there's many perspectives there. So first of all, we can talk about like mitigating climate change. So like preventing emissions or removing carbon from the atmosphere, sort of making sure that things don't get too out of control. We can also talk about more adapting to climate change or building some amount of preparation for what's to come. Like, like Danny was saying, it's possible that we're already on this course where there's going to be some really difficult to deal with irreversible changes that could mean a lot of the world is, for instance, without food is, is one concern that the climate's going to change, which is going to lead to droughts and famines that'll have a lot of, you know, affect a lot of people's lives. And so I think you can think about it if you want to mitigate climate change or if you want to adapt to it. Ideally, we do both. Um, we can prepare everything that we can in order to either prevent as much climate change as possible or deal with the climate, the climate change that does end up happening. Um, I spend most of my time thinking about mitigating. and I'm very optimistic as a person. I believe that we have a lot of hope of really addressing climate change and making limiting the damage that ends up happening. I think when it comes to mitigating, some of the most important things we need to figure out are how can we get a lot more clean energy? How can we decarbonize some sectors that are right now producing carbon, not from energy, but from having to burn fossil fuels, such as, such as in steel production or cement production is another tricky to decarbonize sector. And even you can think about beef as like a, tricky to decarbonize sector because cows burp methane. That's a potent greenhouse gas. Companies like Beyond or Impossible are figuring out how we can maybe phase some of that out. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done basically to decarbonize. And then the last part there is removing carbon from the atmosphere. So it's kind of like we've already emitted too much. We have to figure out how to literally bring some of that carbon out if we want to limit climate change to the levels that the scientists at UN suggest that we should limit it to. So the really good news here is that there are markets for uh, taking carbon out of the atmosphere and sticking it back um, into the biomass or geosphere. Um, the bad news is, is that there's not enough supply in these markets today. There are about 2000 uh, like carbon offset projects around the world um, that are selling offsets actively today. Um, that it sounds like a lot, uh, but uh, the problem is that verification has been like a little shady here, and uh, I, most most of the projects um, don't actually have the impact that they promise. So ProPublica published this piece in May of last year that looked at um, several hundred of these projects and estimated that anywhere between seventy to 85% of all carbon offset projects uh, don't actually have the impact that they promise, which is one ton of carbon removed or, or, or uh, prevented um, for, for every offset. Totally. So let, let's pretend that us three are running a venture firm and it's called Mitigation Ventures or, or Save the World Ventures. And we're entirely focused on, on, on this space. What, what's our thesis? What, what are the subsectors that we're taking startups in or that we're, we're looking at that we think could potentially yield good investments in 2020? Uh, what's our request for startups? Uh, Danny, I'll let you start and take, uh, take any of those. Well, so at USB, we were kind of looking, we had this exact same question, hypothetically, if we were a venture firm and we wanted to invest in this space. 
Um, but at the same time, we were also trying to offset our own footprint. And our footprint at USV is mostly from flights. And so we were just looking for a place to offset our flights. It was weird how confusing that was to do. Um, the first thing we did is we just like pulled up all of our flights uh, from the last year manually because there aren't very many easily available automatic tools to do that, even though that's the first step for every company to offset their, their footprint. Um, and then the next thing we did is we entered all of those flights one by one into uh, carbon footprint calculators. And there are a bunch on the web and they all spot out different numbers um, that were uh, like orders of magnitude actually apart from each other. And, uh, and the problem with that is all these calculators on the face of it look very legitimate. <laughs> like one will be backed by the UN and one will be backed by an aviation like consortium on climate something. And, and yet like it was just confusing from the start, how much carbon do we actually offset? And then we were like, okay, we kind of have a sense of how much carbon we need to offset. Now, where, where do we go by those offsets? And um, it's, uh, it, it, we, we read that ProPublica piece about, you know, a majority of offsets not being impactful. We wanted to have impact. And so we were trying to figure out how we could guarantee impact. And then when we would talk to, you know, brokers who are reselling uh, carbon offsets, we'd ask them if for every dollar we pay them, how much actually makes it to the project and is paying for carbon to be offset. And basically no one could tell us. And so this to me, it looks like a very, very high confusion, low trust space. Like all of the carbon offset industry is trying to promise consumers impact. And yet they break that promise through every interaction users have with them because it's just too confusing and feels too sketchy. And so the first like kind of thesis you could have in this space is that there needs to be a high trust provider here, like someone who promises impact to users and actually delivers it. And you can feel that delivery in every user experience, which is actually how we came across uh, Landon and his team. Yeah, I'd say zooming out from that a little bit too. I think carbon offsets are a great example of an easy thing for companies to do about climate change, like probably switching to renewable energy and offsetting carbon, especially from business travel. They're reasonably easy to do. Like like Danny was saying, you have there's it's a very confusing market. You have to do your research. You have to find companies that you can trust to do those carbon offsets. But it's it's fairly easy to do. And I think lots of companies are looking for those low hanging fruit things they can do about climate change, whether that's offsetting their carbon footprint, going to renewable energy, or even just like if they're getting catering for an event and they know that vegan catering is going to be better for the planet, maybe they'll consider that. And I think that's kind of tapping into this idea that a lot of people are really happy making an easy choice for the climate. I think as consumer awareness and as just generally people around the world see that climate change is this huge crisis that we need to deal with, um, we'll see more and more people looking for the easy ways to make a difference. So I think that's that's one area the that the thesis can focus on. I think that's right. And then the next thing we would say is, uh, as the effects of the climate crisis become more and more apparent, like for example, like awful fires in Australia or uh, having t-shirt weather in January in New York, more and more uh, people will push for the companies that they work for and buy from uh, to, to be part of this movement that is um, helping uh, offset their carbon. The problem is that there's not enough good supply. And so um, maybe another place uh, we would think about investing is places that are creating more supply of good quality, trustworthy, verifiable carbon offsetting. Yeah, and similar to creating that supply too, there's some amount of technology creation that is yet to be done around decarbonizing tricky industries where like steel production or cement production those are tricky things that there aren't a lot of ways to reduce the emissions of. So for now, we can see offsets and carbon removal as a good option for companies in those industries. But I also think if entrepreneurs were out there creating really solid solutions to making carbon-free cement or steel, or there's a handful, airplanes are another great example where you kind of just have to burn jet fuel right now based on our technology. That is an area that I think we'll see a lot of change in over the next couple decades, hopefully. And I think that requires definitely a lot of deep scientific background if it's a, a venture firm specifically focused on that. And maybe it's less so software that a lot of folks invest in right now. Um, but I think 
that is another huge opportunity as well as the more consumer or people oriented products that are making the easy decisions to choose a climate friendly product over a not climate friendly product. Maybe kind of a bigger picture here is that there's this sort of change happening in carbon markets generally, where historically there are a lot of very fragmented players and they all kind of just uh, act as these sort of middle brokers. So there are like organizations that create the protocols uh, for which a type of offset can be verified. Like how, how do you verify a deforestation project? And so they'll just have a protocol, which is like, um, you know, send people every two years to the project and count trees or, you know, whatever it is. And, and then there are um, agencies or, uh, that, that do the auditing of, of these other agencies, verification protocols. Um, and so if you are a project, you hire one of these auditors. Um, there, there are organizations that uh, are just registries of uh, carbon projects and uh, their offsets that can be sold. Um, there are uh, brokers that uh, buy and sell um, the, these offsets. There are marketplaces that sit on top that buy from the brokers and resell it to consumers or companies. There are kind of consulting firms that, that uh, like help more enterprise-like companies buy uh, offsets. And then there are all these kind of tools and services for the project developers themselves. And so it's like really fragmented and there are a lot of pieces in the middle and it's kind of unclear that having so many pieces creates a lot of value in, in this chain. And it's actually very important that we uh, like keep all of the value that we can here. And so it's very possible that something that's emerging here is a more um, kind of compact stack where instead of all of these different agencies that each uh, have their like stamp of approval on a carbon offset, it will be kind of more like there's one trusted uh, place that is not only a registry for offsets that you can buy, uh, but also helps verify them and, and provide their trusted stamp of approval for these projects and also sell them to consumers. And it's just one place, um, and which means that more of the dollars are going toward the projects and helping them do what they do. Yeah. To zoom out a little bit, there was a clean tech uh, sort of bust in the in sort of late 2000s, right? That uh, people were excited about it or bubble and, and it didn't really go anywhere. When you characterize the differences between what happened then and what's happening now and what's the why now in terms of why investing in the space is different? Yeah, USB invested in one climate company at that time too. Um, in 2008, USB invested in a company called Amy, which helped companies uh, track their carbon footprint across their supply chain. And um, I, w- I mean, I wasn't there at the time, but what I've heard is that Amy had kind of a lot of interest. Uh, people were really excited about it, but no one wanted to buy because there wasn't yet a sense of urgency about the, the crisis. And so um, I, th- I think because of the like exponential rate of change with, with which the, the climate is, is changing, um, people are more and more aware and there's a greater sense of urgency, uh, which, which is why there's all of a sudden um, kind of demand to sell into today. I would also say that that there's different types of business models here where I think a lot of clean tech companies struggled because they were really capital intensive and really it was hard to make much margin. So I think that's another factor to consider is that there are just some business models that are more capable of growing quickly and sustainably than others. And power companies, for instance, are can have a difficult time you have to raise a lot of capital and there's all sorts of challenges. But today I think we're seeing a lot of really small kind of new climate tech startups that have creative business models that have no, that are much less capital intensive and have no barriers to just start growing quickly, which is really exciting um, because of the impact that can have on our climate. Yeah. Let's talk about different uh, renewable energy. There's uh, you know, solar, wind, uh, we haven't talked about nuclear. Why don't you give some commentary on how these sort of uh, different types of energy ha- have evolved and, and where we're at in terms of are they actually, you know, startups in the space or startups leveraging them that are, that are interesting? Yeah, totally. Um, well, in the U.S., uh, electricity counts for a quarter of all the carbon emissions. So it's a really, really important place to start thinking about uh, new ways of doing things. It's uh, in, in the last 10 or so years, uh, there's been an emergence of a sort of uh, deregulated electricity market in several states. I believe now, 14 states in the U.S. now have deregulated energy markets. And what that means is that uh, power production and um, and then selling the power are decoupled. And so all of a sudden you can have uh, like competition uh, among uh, like suppliers of electricity selling electricity to consumers. 
um, which is really cool. So like someone can start up, buy electricity wholesale from a, a wind generator, and then sell it to consumers and say, we're going to sell you um, 100% wind, wind energy, even if your utility doesn't think that's important and isn't buying that for you. And so that's creating a lot of space for innovation. Um, and it's really cool what people are doing there. Yeah, I'd say generally, too, I think an exciting thing is we're just seeing the costs coming down a ton over time for both solar and wind. Those ones are growing to be more and more of electricity generated worldwide. Um, And I think some countries have done a really good job of subsidizing those or otherwise making the economics work out where where they grow substantially. I think in the U S we're moving a little bit slow there, uh, like a carbon price or a carbon tax or really great subsidies would help move the needle a lot for renewable energy. But even without those sorts of subsidies, because the costs are falling so much, it, it looks like a really bright future for renewables right now. That's so true. So in the last 40 years, the price of wind and solar have fallen 90%, which is wild. And so, uh, coal and all these other kind of really carbon emitting forms of energy uh, get $26 billion in subsidies from the U.S. government every year. It's absurd. And the coal, natural gas, and uh, fossil fuel industry spend $400,000 a day lobbying U.S. government. They re- like, like, we are tipping the scale in the wrong direction. And yet wind and solar are able to beat coal and fossil fuels uh, just because of markets today and just because the price has gone down so much. And so that's very, very exciting because often regulation moves slowly, but markets move fast. And so because the economics are in place, we can move a lot faster on important things like replacing fossil fuels with wind and solar. And and why is the price fallen? Just because of technology innovation? Yeah, and and economies of scale. What do you, or or Danny, what's your take on nuclear? Are there startups that could leverage build there or is it is a much bigger player how, how do we think about that I'm, I'm sure there are so uh usb has a very small fund relatively speaking um each fund each uh fund is about 200 million dollars which is uh big in dollar amounts small in venture amounts it means that we can make about uh like 10 ish early stage investments uh, out of each fund and and so we because the funds are small ish uh, we think a lot about what are capital intensive businesses that we could help back. Because if we back a capital, or sorry, not a capital intensive business, exactly the opposite of that. Uh, because if we back a business that's not very capital intensive, we, we can continue to back them for a very long time and like, you know, be, help be a part of their journey. Um, more than if we back something like a nuclear production company, um, which needs a lot of, uh, dollars just to get, to get a thing working. Um, and so I haven't spent a lot of my time there, uh, but I think it's incredibly important. Uh, on your deck, you, you talk about virtual power plants. Uh, what could that look like? Oh, my God. So, okay. So the best book I've read on uh, electricity is called The Grid. It's by someone named Gretchen Blake. And uh, this book describes how the grid got to be where it is. And it describes this kind of like motion of going from super decentralized. Um, electricity was very weak. We only use direct current and there were no standards. And so there was literally in every town a different electricity company uh, to connect, uh, you know, for cars and for factories. It was as decentralized as it is. And then uh, it became very centralized with the advent of uh, alternating current, which meant that you could send electricity uh, longer um, distances. And so all of a sudden, one company could send electricity in a very far distance and start to aggregate all all of these uh, kind of smaller direct current electricity providers. And then now it's kind of on its way to becoming decentralized again. So it's this like really interesting way of wave of like decentralized to centralized back to decentralized. And what we're seeing now is because of things like solar panels, instead of uh, you know very centralized power plants that just create energy in in one place um, and distribute it everywhere, it's uh, energy is being generated uh, kind of in all different places. <laughs> um, and instead of energy going one way from the power plant to the consumer, energy kind of flows bidirectionally. Um, so you, you can you can create energy at your house with your solar panel and you can sell it back to the grid. One of the really interesting things that happens there is uh, the grid is like not built for this at all. Uh, but one of the like features of uh, renewable energy is that like when the sun is shining, all the solar panels get a lot of sun all at once. And the grid is created in such a way in which it, it can't meter and say, stop sending sun power here, um, the, it's like overheating the grid and it fries the wires. And actually the grid is uh, set up in such a way in which there's, if there's too much electricity on the wires, 
it shuts off in order to like save itself. And so this is like just a super interesting thing that's happening here. And so on one hand, there's this tension of like, the grid is not set up for this. But on the other hand, there's this new thing of like, we can create power everywhere. And if it's all networked, then we can help balance the grid. And so that's the whole idea behind virtual power plants, which is like, let's let's not only create energy in several different places um, close to its source using renewable methods, let's also have this be networked so we can manage the grid in a good way um, and get the benefits both of renewable energy and have uh, like reliable infrastructure. Uh, Landon, how does REN become a multi-billion dollar business? Yeah, so we think of REN as kind of like an on-ramp for anyone who wants to start doing something about climate change. So we think that's, if we're zooming out, thinking about the billion-dollar business type view, you know, 10 years down the road or however long, we think both for consumers and for businesses. And so if we see lots and lots of small businesses looking for the easiest thing to do about climate change... I think REN can be extremely valuable for them. And I think it can also be extremely valuable for consumers who kind of want the same thing. Like they want to say, okay, what can I do as one person to have an impact on our climate? I think the economics of it can be pretty straightforward. If we just charge a a fee for carbon offsets that we provide, so similar to how the industry works today, where there's, as Danny mentioned, there's different groups who all have to take their own cut of the final cost of offsetting a ton of carbon. REN can streamline that a bit and we can still take a fee and then sell carbon offsets to companies and individuals who want to do something that's easy. It's just buying something like that's what, that's kind of what we're good at that maybe is somewhat responsible for getting us into this mess. Um, And really with our current business model, it's only like a 1% of the U.S. population or so supporting projects on REN to offset their carbon footprint before it's already doing $100 million in revenue or so. And I think with businesses as well and with more and more of the world, you know, beyond the United States too, caring about this, I think there's space for multiple businesses similar to REN to actually be multi-billion dollar companies, which is Part of why I'm excited here, too, is that there's just a a lot of opportunity opening up now that more and more people just care about the climate. Like it's going from being some distant problem that, you know, we hear about and maybe should care about to being the number one issue on on people's mind, especially for younger people. So I think just more and more there's going to be demand for companies to take action for banks and investment vehicles to take action by moving their investments out of fossil fuels and also for individuals to take action. And I think REN is just one of the many pieces of that picture that is going to become a pretty large chunk of the economy. It's, it's basically like we have to rebuild the economy to get off of fossil fuels, which means that it's going to be there's going to be a lot of large multi-billion dollar companies built for this transition. And, and, and say more about where they could like potentially look in terms, uh, in terms of where is the white space? If, if you were actively angel investing in the, in the space, what's your, where, where you'd be eager to see more experimentation or, or more entrepreneurs building? Yeah. So even just in the carbon offset world, which is probably what I know most about, If you just look at companies, there's a lot of different types of companies. Like Microsoft has a big commitment to go carbon neutral for their whole existence. So this is going back to their founding date. They want to offset all the emissions they've ever put in the atmosphere. And they also are being pretty stringent of what they're willing to accept as an offset. Like they really care about carbon removal. They're asking all the right questions about fraud and um, what's called additionality, which is making sure the carbon is actually removed because someone's paying for it and not because it was just going to happen anyway. So I think at the top of the market, you have companies like Microsoft. Hopefully we'll see all large tech companies and then even other large companies making climate commitments. And that alone, just like the top 1%, like the sort of the Fortune 100 companies just focusing on them to offset their carbon footprint. I think that's going to be big enough on its own to warrant a company or two. And then you move more into mid market, and lots of companies there want to offset their carbon footprint. At REN, we're not even really focusing on that. Um, 
because it, they have their own sets of problems about accounting for their carbon emissions. And I think there, there's going to be a couple companies there, both on the offset side, as well as carbon accounting, like figuring out what they're really putting in the atmosphere, as well as probably just general employee engagement and sustainability initiatives that companies can do to show their employees that they're acting on climate change. Because I think that's what a lot of employees are going to demand. And then there's, you know, small to medium businesses, there's probably going to be, we already see a lot of brands built around sustainability. And I think climate is going to be more and more part of that sustainability, as well as something that you don't associate as much with sustainability brands. Like I think more in San Francisco, for instance, I've been to a couple of restaurants where they have like a a carbon tax basically for the meal and you wouldn't associate it with being an especially sustainable restaurant, but it, it's just something that either the owners and operators care about or that customers care about. So it's like that whole range of companies, each with their own complications. Like if they have a giant supply chain, they have to account for all those carbon emissions. Or if they are completely B2B, they'll want to package their PR around what they're doing for the climate differently than if it's a consumer facing company. So I think there's, there's like a whole world where there's probably going to be different vertical specific companies, maybe for carbon accounting or for the offsets themselves too. Lots of companies care about having an offset project that resonates with their brand or what they already do. Um, and that, that's, yeah, that's just in the carbon offset world, but that's probably where I know what I know best. Yeah. Um, when, when we were kind of first looking at this space, uh, Albert hosted this dinner at, at the USC office with a bunch of people who are spending kind of their life on uh, like trying to help reverse the climate crisis. And uh, it was so interesting. There was this one topic of conversation that no one could agree about, which was, uh, can individual action uh, help? Like, does individual action matter? And it was this huge riff in the room, right? Like, half of the group said, there's no way enough individuals are going to take action for for there to be any substantive, like, change. And then the other half said, of course there is. uh, Like, this is the biggest crisis of our, you know, of our lifetimes, of our generation. And so this was uh, maybe in July. And in September... Uh, the last week of September, there were climate marches around the world in 4,500 um, cities in 150 countries. Four million people showed up. Like people care so much. And if you just, and so let's say that all four million of those people wanted to, I don't know, uh, offset offset their uh, footprint. Um, you can you can offset your carbon footprint for about twenty dollars a month. Um, and so if all four million of those people decided they wanted to start offsetting their carbon footprint, that's almost a um, billion dollars a year. Um, of spend on taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the ground. And so that's very exciting. Um, and so, yes, uh, there's a big uh, opportunity here in uh, helping businesses do that, but also there's a huge opportunity here in just helping individuals do this. Yeah, and more than offsetting for individuals too, like Aspiration is a bank that I honestly I should know more about, but they have launched funds that are divested from fossil fuels. So you can have fossil fuel free investment vehicles. And there's probably going to be a a couple of those either banks or some form of, I don't know, could be interesting even to see like something like Robinhood integrating some information about the carbon impact of different stocks. Like I think it's, it's probably going to ripple throughout the economy and, and both like the more business side of accounting for carbon and offsetting or reducing their carbon footprints, as well as the individual side of just a lot of people asking, hey, what can I do? And I think when individuals are asking what they can do, they're probably going to look at what's easiest as a place to start. So maybe that's just just buying more sustainable clothing like Patagonia, or maybe it's something like Ren that's offsetting your carbon footprint or making a few big decisions around what appliances they want to use or what type of electricity that they want to get in their home to make a big difference too. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you mentioned the, the the heated discussion or or disagreement. What what are the other heated disagreements you've been a part of or that you've just seen in the space right now as we're trying to make sense of it, that maybe the, perhaps the different opinions around uh, various issues that are, that are most interesting to you. 
By yeah. the way, heated debate is the correct word for uh, <laughs> the global heating. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a very interesting political debate happening um, in this space. There are kind of two camps. So one one camp uh, that I very much fall in, fall into uh, says says that uh, the biggest help that we can have in this quest to like help reverse the damage of the climate crisis has already done is on the tra trajectory to do is to price carbon is to make it really really expensive to emit carbon and the reason why this can't exist is because you know uh markets have shown to be very effective at creating quick change and incentivizing behavior and so by just kind of tipping the scale in in the form of carbon being extremely expensive to use um, and to emit the, the people will make different choices. And so um, the IPCC, which is a UN kind of coalition, UN group of uh, multiple governments, and it's a kind of like a panel on climate change, um, came out last year and said the correct price uh, the carbon needs to be at for, uh, for uh, us to tip the scale enough for this to be an effective like means of, of um, like stopping the damage is carbon needs to be priced at at least like the floor is $135 a ton. And so, Kind of one political camp says, okay, we should have carbon pricing and it should be substantially high. Um, and it should probably be at the price that the IPCC recommends, which is $135 a ton. And this is pretty bipartisan, actually. This is not political in the, in the sense of like Republican versus Democrat. It's, it's just because it regards to politics. So for example, uh, you know, on, in this camp last year, 45 economists published a letter in the Wall Street Journal asking for a carbon tax in the US and that included like uh, two former treasury secretaries. Uh, I think it was like four former federal reserve chairs, like just this really amazing group all came out and said, this is a thing that we, that we need to do. Okay, so that's one camp and, and, and uh, pretty interesting. Then, then there's this other camp that says, you know, <laughs> taxes are expensive to people. Um, what, what we actually need to do is we need to use uh, this opportunity to shift the economy and sh shift different systems as a way to create new jobs. And so this is the kind of like the Green New Deal camp, which says we need something that looks a lot more like a new deal than a tax. We need public funding and public ownership of new projects uh, that, that helps make, um, you know, build a more sustainable future uh, world and economy. And so that's kind of an interesting disagreement. I think they're like, I think it's a very important issue that needs to be sorted out very, very fast. Um, and, and so maybe that's kind of, one in this space that, that uh, people are working about. Yeah, fascinating. I'm curious to get, get, get either of your opinion on what is the proper role of government uh, in this in this space in terms of one on the R and D level uh, and then two on the regulatory level. I think climate change and carbon emissions is a great place for the government to be involved because it's really just a tragedy of the commons problem. Like we have a common asset, the atmosphere. And we're damaging it. We're, we're causing these negative externalities by emitting carbon. And so I think that's part of why, I, to me, a carbon price is such an elegant solution, because then you can just put a price on that negative externality and hopefully affect the kind of change that we need to see in order to reverse climate change if the, if the price is set high enough. Um, so I think government absolutely has to play a huge role. And I think it'll take a large government intervention in order to get the systems change we need across the world in order for us to not have to worry about climate change again. I think that's just impossible to do with just technology or just just hoping that some other solution is going to come out of the sky. Part, part of people's belief here about uh, kind of this other camp of why a sort of carbon price might not work is watching um, the Yellow Vest protests in France last year. France was an, uh, announcing a uh, essentially a carbon tax. The, the price of fuel was going to increase by 25 cents a gallon. The, by the way, the price of gas in France already is, is double the price in, in the U.S. It's just like, extremely expensive. And uh, this is after that uh, the French government lowered uh, taxes on the rich earlier that year. Um, people felt this was very unjust. Only a quarter of the $40 million that would have been raised by this tax were actually going back to help uh, people like make up for now having to spend more money. And so uh, people protested for weeks um, about this. It was, uh, and so a lot of people in government, I think, looked at that and said, okay, people do not want to tax. And because we need to make progress here, we need a different way. And maybe that way is about jobs. Um, but by the way, one, one of the more exciting things that a government could do here 
is use the funds raised by uh, a sort of carbon tax um, to put it back to the people. Like a carbon tax could fund a sort of UBI, which is amazing. So the Canadian government is doing that now. Um, Canada started a carbon pricing uh, program in a few of the provinces. Uh, the, the price is too low. It's about $20 a ton, but like, you know, a price is a price. It's on the right direction. And they're using 90% of those funds to redistribute as a sort of rebate. Um, and two days ago, uh, the Financial Times reported that uh, most households in, in Canada and in areas that are um, currently using this carbon pricing are getting back in rebates more than they have to pay extra in, in the price of um, goods. And so that's really, really exciting. In that letter from the Economist and the Wall Street Journal about how we need a carbon tax in the U.S., um, they wrote that a $40 per ton uh, tax in the U.S. Um, would lead to a $2,000 per year uh, rebate to most to, to American families, which is awesome. But actually, that price is too low. The price needs to be three times higher. And so you could imagine a world in which families are making $500 a month off of a carbon tax, like, like a government that's very... Uh, forward thinking here could create a UBI off of the carbon tax and, and solve two really interesting things in one. Yeah, there's a great group in the US working on that called Citizens Climate Lobby. And there's actually an act going through right now, I believe, the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act that would do exactly that. So that's definitely something if listeners are out there thinking what they can do as an individual. One thing you could do is get involved with groups like Citizen Climate Lobby who are pushing for that sort of legislation. Yeah. I want to add one more thing, which, which is about government and the climate, which is one of the things that makes it difficult to create change in government today regarding climate is that uh, is the effect of money today in U.S. politics. And so one of the really inspiring things a government could do today is try to reduce or just eliminate the effect of money in politics. The oil and gas industry spends $400,000 a day lobbying Congress. They get $26 billion in subsidies every year. Like, this is just uh, the wrong way that we want to take the scale. And, and so another inspiring way that government could act would be to try to limit that. Uh, do you have a stance on the debate, the Green New Deal versus the alternative way that you were mentioning earlier? Lynn, what do you think? You know, I kind of take this opinion of everything and, like, anything that we can do, we should just do it. Like, we should not be trying to split hairs here and figure out the exact best solution. Like, we should just we really don't have much time. There's, there's some reports that say 2030 is, is a year that we want to start drastically reducing our carbon emissions. Um, I think basically in order to stay on track with limiting global warming to an, am- an amount that would be reasonable for humans for just for our well-being, we have to really be acting in this decade. And I think that might mean accepting solutions that we don't think are the ideal solution, but are moving the right direction. So I would, I would say yes to both those. Like I would absolutely be really excited about legislation passing. That's like a green new deal, or that's a carbon price. Personally, I think the carbon price and carbon fee and dividend kind of some sort of tax that redistributes the revenue back to regular people would be a really cool solution, both for finding really efficient pathways to reducing carbon emissions. So kind of like letting the market figure it out as opposed to the government deciding um, a lot of the details of which technologies are going to be winners here. And I also think it's cool from the standpoint of the people who are most affected by climate change are usually those on the front lines who can't afford to, can't afford to pay basically some problems that climate change produces, you can just pay for it. Like if food is more expensive, you can just pay for more expensive food if you have that money. So I think a, some sort of legislation that pushes money back to people who are being really affected by climate change can help a lot. Yeah. Markets are just so efficient and you know, carbon pricing for a government is not all that progressive today. There are 40 governments around the world who already have carbon pricing. So it's not like, this crazy new thing. It's already happening. The only problem is that the carbon prices today by all 40 of these governments are far too low. So like in Canada, the price is $20 per ton of carbon. That's too low. In California, it's $15 a ton. In the UK, it's $25 a ton. And in places like California and the UK, that doesn't even apply to everyone. It's, it's like cap and trade program that only applies to some emissions by some industries. So anyway, markets are so efficient. Governments are realizing this. They're already putting prices on carbon. 
it's just too low and not enough. Yeah, and kind of bringing this back to the discussion we were having earlier about maybe what ideas are good to invest in here. What are some of the companies going to look like that spawn out of this? Carbon pricing and Green New Deal both have implications for companies. Like carbon pricing basically means that we, if, if we set a high price on carbon, we'll have to have companies that are producing clean energy at a low cost. And it'll be a huge boon for that market. And I think I haven't looked too in too much depth to what the green new, a green new deal would actually look like here, but I think that could also have an effect on picking some of the winners in the space because I think the green new deal also has a certain has had relationships with certain like a negative stances on nuclear, for instance, or it might be pretty opinionated about what technologies or solutions it wants to support. So I think both those are worth thinking about from an investment perspective as well. And thinking about what the future of policy related to climate change in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world, too, will look like. What explains the negative stigma against nuclear from from that group? There's one perspective that's we've seen a lot of nuclear power plants like melting down and just really, really bad stuff around nuclear power plants which is really shocking and like alarming to look at. And I think that's part of the reason for a little bit of concern around choosing nuclear. I also think there's this idea of like an extractive economy. So an economy that's pumping oil out of the ground and burning coal and kind of extracting resources from the earth. And nuclear is similar where it's, you know, you're extracting something, you're using something, there's waste produced. And some people have the the opinion that we have to move from this extractive economy to a regenerative economy, which would be more in line with renewables. I think another part of nuclear energy that's maybe not talked about enough, in my opinion, is that we don't have a great track record of producing nuclear power plants at low cost and at a reasonable timeline. And because climate change is so urgent, I think it's worth, it's definitely worth trying out more nuclear um, technologies and seeing what's possible there, but it can't be relied on as a sure thing that we can scale up over the next 10, 20 years when we really want to be making a dent in our emissions. So I think those are just some of the factors. I think it sort of depends who you talk to, why they are worried about nuclear power as a solution, but you definitely see a lot of concern with nuclear power in the United States. It's so important to recognize like the dire situation that we are currently in. Like uh, the World Bank two years ago released a report uh, that, that asked countries to prepare for 100 million people to be dislocated and need, uh, and, and need to move around due to the climate crisis. Um, we are currently on track if we change nothing for, uh, for to lose a lot of farmland over the next 80 years. Like we're currently on track just in China for a third of all rice fields uh, to be unfarmable, uh, for half of all corn fields, for a fifth of all uh, wheat fields. We're, we're on track for half of all of our coffee land to be unfarmable by the end of the century, um, for half of all of our fisheries uh, to, to, uh, to, to be like out of uh, order. And so um, th- like the state here is actually just so dire. It's, um that we just need to act very quickly. And so there are a lot of kind of political opinions about nuclear, no nuclear, tax, new job, whatever it is. But really the answer to all of it is we just need to move forward um, like collectively as as a globe. My guests today have been Landon Brand of Wren and Danny Grant of USV. For people who want to learn deeper about uh, what you're doing, uh, Landon, and uh, want to learn more about the the topic, Danny, in terms of your research, where might you point them? Uh, Danny, we'll start with you. Albert uh, posted a great blog post um, about how we are thinking about the climate crisis on uh, USV.com. And right at the bottom of the post is a link to our internal research deck. It's like where we as a team have been sharing uh, our research. And so maybe that's a, an interesting place to start. And if I can ever be useful, feel free to check out our website, projectren.com. And you can always email us team at projectren.com. We love talking about ways that we can address the climate crisis. So I'm really happy to do that. Guys, this has been a fantastic episode. Uh, Landon, Danny, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, Eric. (laughs) Thanks so much. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.